Um, I don't normally cross myself before a sermon, so uh, just so you know, that means it's going to get real. <laughs> it's been a kind of a difficult week for me. Um, I, uh, as most of you know, I by vocational, so I have a regular job with all the troubles that that entails, and family life, and then ministry, and all those things. And um, just like uh, the disciples grumbling in our gospel lesson this uh, morning, I'm going to uh, try my best not to grumble here today. There is a point to this. Um, for most of us, we, at least for most of us, we want some sort of level of security in our lives, do we not? We want to know that we're financially secure. We want to know that there's a roof over our heads. We want to know that our children are going to be taken care of. There's going to be food the next time we get hungry. And uh, for me, I can prove this through the psychological batteries they get at seminary. My level of need for security almost becomes pathological. I, uh, I've got a habit. And uh, it drives decisions in my life. And... Uh, Financial security was a decision for being a bivocational pastor in the first place coming out of seminary. Um, it didn't help that we had a, a huge debt that came out of seminary that we're trying to pay off. But uh, out of my class of uh, roughly 60-some uh, gentlemen who graduated with me, I was the only one to take the bivocational call. It's been quite an interesting two years, two and a half years since then, uh, of having to explain to people that, no, I'm not a full-time pastor. I do ministry. I am ordained. Yes, I suffered through seminary and all those things. But uh, uh, it, it is a little bit of a, a weird position, at least within our church body. Some churches, it's more prevalent than others. But then things happen in your life. Um, I took a job where I, uh, I basically, for the last eight months of my life, have totally focused on because it's such a mess and thought things were going good, and then one hiccup down the road, and then all of a sudden, hey, you're getting disciplined. And, uh, you know, it was that that really triggered that this week for me to really step back and take a uh, look at my life and, and where I'm at, and the things that I'm doing, the things I'm doing well, but the things I'm not doing so well. And I, I think for, for most of us, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, it's, the times when things aren't going the way you expect them that makes you sit back and on your heels and say, well, maybe you need to reconsider this. You know, maybe it's time to return to the Lord and see what he would have. Um, it's not the good times that draw us closer to God. At least that's been my personal experience. It's the times that are more difficult. And uh, so my bubble of security was kind of popped early this week. And it's been on my mind all week. And that triggers other things to think about and, and so forth and so on. But uh, what I wanted to speak to you about this morning was, in particular, our epistle reading. Now, our epistle reading, as well as our Old Testament, our gospel reading, are all intricately connected. There's, 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 the messages are very similar. Um, the, uh, the, way that they are, the way that the writers of those uh, various books have put it is... Uh, slightly different nuance, but really, if, when you get to the heart of the matter, they're all talking about the same thing. Um, so, let's, I'd like to start by uh, just reading, go through some of the verses in chapter 5 of Ephesians, and our, our epistle reading picks up in chapter, or I'm, I'm sorry, verse 6 of chapter 5, but I want to back up, and you can follow along with me if you'd like. I'm going to pick up at verse 1, just to give a little bit of the background about what Paul's talking about here. <coughs> Um, because I've been accused of, uh, of not having the uh, uh, bubbly, smiling attitude. The one thing I will say that came out of uh, good this week was uh, it, uh, it has given me the material for the next two weeks of sermons. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, next week uh, I'll get into it a little bit more uh, because the uh, just to prove I went to seminary as well, the lectionary on the, um, the lectio continua, that's the, uh, the continuous lectionary. So next week, actually, um, we'll talk about Ephesians chapter 5 again, because um, sometimes in our lectionary, uh, they do whole chunks. So it's a, a group of verses in the context, and then the next one, and the next one. So next week, we're going to talk about submission. And you might want to throw me out of here after that, but I'll do uh, Pastor Weiss' 30 work for him and talk about that. 
um, and, and how maybe even this situation I'm in right now, contemplating, fits into that um, about being a husband and a father, <coughs> that sort of thing. So that, there's your preview for next week, basically. Okay? But starting with verse 1 of chapter 5. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. What we're going to see here very shortly is he's going to get into some law. Um, in seminary, it's quite interesting. Um, they, Lutherans don't like to have the gospel and the law mangled up. Um, everybody kind of heard of this before you know our distinction of law and gospel. And, well, what do you do when... When uh, it seems like Paul's giving full-on law in his epistles, uh, well, they call it gospel appeals, which is cheating. It's law. Anytime in the scriptures there's a command or a Greek and imperative, he's telling you to do something. Well, that kind of falls under the law category, at least in my book. But before he gets there, he's reminding them, though, in these first two verses about why we are imitators of God. We're imitators of God because we are his beloved children. Because we are to walk in love because Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So he's reminding them that this isn't a law that's a compulsive kind of law that says you must do this because your salvation depends on it. Because if you don't do this, your merit to get the, uh, the card up, um, to get into heaven for eternity is part of this. It's tied up in this somehow. No. He's saying that we're supposed to do this because Christ was our Imitator. I mean, we're supposed to be Im imitators of Christ because Christ first did this for us. And then continuing with verse 3. But sexual immorality and all impurity or co covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. That's starting to get into some law there, isn't it? Well, it gets harsher. Just hold on. Verse 4. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who, has, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, we, we read that, and it's easy to, to gloss over that and say, no, oh, that doesn't really fit me. But maybe some of you read over this and think, this fits me exactly. And as I was preparing for this sermon and kind of the, the brokenness that bubbled up to the surface for me, at least that was triggered by, by uh, the security of my job being broken this week, the false security, I should say. I look at this and I'm like, well, I'm no better than the um, Ephesians that Paul is writing this letter to. Um, one of the things that makes it more difficult, and again, I'm not whining because I don't want to be accused of that, is being a, uh, a bivocational pastor puts you kind of in awkward positions because you're amongst co-workers who could care less about the fact that you're a pastor. In fact, I, I don't openly discuss that with many of the people in my, who I work with. Some of them know it. But you want to fit in. Right? I mean, we all want to fit in when we go and we work amongst our co-workers. And honestly, that drives me to do and say things that uh, are quite frankly talked about here. And that's a battle that I have constantly because I want to fit in, but yet I shouldn't be doing these things, but I do and I keep doing it. I don't know if that's a problem that any of you have with, uh, as you go out into the world. And if you don't, God bless you. If you do, just as I do, keep struggling. Fight against that urge. Starting with verse 6, and this is picked up in our uh, bulletin this morning. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the souls of disobedience. So we're not to let empty words, empty words being the words of this world, this fallen world, this evil world that Paul is going to later talk about. These are the words that we're not supposed to let fill our heads. We're supposed to fight against it. It's the words that are said. Maybe it's a co-worker says something, and you have a complex like I do a one-upsmanship. Before you know it, you're saying things you shouldn't say. Things that uh, Paul is going to talk about here, things that uh, shouldn't even be uttered. 
These are the things that we're called not to do as Christians. Let no one deceive you with the empty words, with these empty words, because they will be punished, the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You see, all of us, of course, are born eternally separated from God. It's because God drew near to us. It's because of what Christ did on the cross, Him suffering and dying and hanging on a cursed tree. That crucifix behind us reminds us that what is, what is given to us on that altar, the body and blood of Christ, is not just bread and wine, that God actually became human and died for us. We were darkness. But now we are light because of the Lord. Not because of anything we did, but because he drew near to us. Because he made us our, his children, part of the heavenly family. Like I was talking with the children about earlier. So, what does Paul continue with? Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Makes sense, right? Christ has done these things for us. We know he's done them for us. We don't do it out of some requirement of the law. We walk as children of the light because we know what he has done for us. And knowing what he has done for us, it makes us want to do these things. Not because we have to, but because of, of the gratitude that rises up in our hearts because of that. So continuing with verse 10. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. You see, this here, it's this try idea. It's not... You're going to do it perfectly. It's not that you're going to figure this all out. It's try. It's this idea that we're going to go through this life and we're going to constantly fail. But it doesn't mean that we fall when we fall flat on our faces that we give up and we say give it over to God. What we do through repentance. I mean, let me clarify that. But that we pick ourselves up with the help of the Lord and we try to do what is right. We try to discern what the Lord would have us do. What is pleasing to him? And why do we do what's pleasing to him? Because of what he has done for us, knowing that he forgives us much all the time. We want to please him. So in verse, uh, verse 11, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful to speak of the things um, that they do in secret. So what are we called to do as Christians? We're called to expose the dark things. That means including the dark things of our lives. They build up over time, do they not? It's easy when we're riding high on the, on, the, on the tip of the wave to push all those bad things in our life down. Yeah, I know I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing, but it's no big deal. And then all of a sudden that wave crashes and we're at the bottom. And then we start really contemplating where we stand before our, before our God. And then it's easy looking up at the next wave coming at us to say, yes, there's things in my life, there's things in all of our lives that need to be exposed to the light because darkness has no place in our hearts. Our lives have been enlightened by God. So he says it's shameful for us to even speak of these things. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. See, did you catch that? That's gospel right there, if you didn't. For anything that becomes visible is light. How do we make the dark things of our heart become light? No brave souls? <coughs> Repentance. Yes, the student down here. <laughs> yes, grasshopper, thank you. If I was more equipped with it, I would have thought of that sooner. Yes, grasshopper, thank you. Absolutely, it's repentance. You know, um, just as a plug, I've only been to one uh, Celebrate Recovery meeting. But those, not being the only way to do this, is certainly a, uh, a way to, uh, to bring, this, bring these things to life. And we're called into community as well. Yes, you can repent to these things in your heart, and it makes it, you're just as forgiven versus if you repent to a church full of people. I could repent every sin that I have that I've committed in the last week, day, um, hours, past couple hours, and you probably all get out and walk out. 
You know, the bottom line is exposing these brings this darkness to light. And when it becomes light, it's visible. God takes it from us. And it's gone. So whether it's in front of a, a group of Christians, fellow Christians in community who you can trust to bring these deep, dark, dark things in your heart out to make them light, or whether you're doing it with your spouse or your children, your parents, it makes no difference. These are the things that our Lord would have us to do. And it's not because he gives us some command that we have to do this, but again, it's for our own benefit that we do these things. So Paul continues, therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Christ will shine on you. Bringing that darkness into the light will allow Christ to remove that darkness from you, so that he will shine on you and make you whole again. Whole maybe not in the sense of in this life, because we know that the sins that we commit in this life are going to impact us, but whole in the sense that on the last day when, he brought, brought, when we are raised from the dead, these sins will be gone forever. We know that Christ will wipe away every tear from our eyes. But for now, we live in this present evil age. Paul calls it that. I'm not afraid to call it that myself because he does. In fact, he's going to talk about this here in another, two more verses. So we continue. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. And the question now becomes, well, how do we walk as wise children instead of unwise children? Verse 16, making the best of the time because the days are evil. The days are evil, so we should make the best of the time that we have here because it's just a little blip when compared with eternity that will come on the last day. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So how do we know what the will of the Lord is? How do we know how to be wise children of God? It's simple. It's His Word. We study God's Word. We pray. We support one another. We, we, we make it our Word because it is the words of life. This is what Jesus is talking about in the Gospel lesson this morning. He is the bread of life come down from heaven. He is wisdom. He is eternal. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Not fear like you're running away from him, but fear that you, you hold him in high esteem. So then we continue. So it's the, well, basically it's the word of the Lord here. So verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit addressing one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the time is short. How do we know? To, how, how can we be wise and know what the will of the Lord is? We study His Word. His law kind of gives us the, the, uh, the rails to stay within. If you're within God's law, then the boundaries of his law, I should say, then you're doing what some things are pleasing to him. It's actually quite wide boundaries. You know, the problem is, where do we want to live? We want to live, what, on the edges or outside of it constantly? And that's the, that's the, uh, the struggle that we face until we take our last breath, is always returning back to the Lord, knowing that he is good and that his mercy endures forever. And finishing up with verse 21, submitting to one another out of the reverence for Christ. So, we live in community. Celebrate Recovery is a perfect microcosm of this congregation, if you really think about it. What it is is a group of Christians that come together, that submit to one another, that are willing to become vulnerable to one another. To tell things that's been held down deep down in their hearts, dark things. <coughs> The only, way you can ex the only way you can get rid of those deep, dark things is expose them to the light so that the Lord can remove them from us. That's what we do as Christians. And that's what we do in community. It's as we also, it's when we go out and we interact with the community. Do they know that we are Christians by our love? Do they know that we're Christians by our actions? 
I know that I failed there. But that's something that uh, I have repented of, and I will ask the Lord to strengthen me so that as I go forward, I can show that love. Because this is an evil time. There are people who are going to go to hell. There are people who need to hear that. There are people that need to see what Christianity is about. And it's not about us. It's about Christ, always. But we should be imitators of Christ to go forth and to spread that saving message of his gospel. But the great thing in all of this is that in the end of the day, even as we struggle and we fail and we fail and we fail and we fail again, Christ always has those words that you are forgiven on his lips when you turn back to him in repentance. He's going to have on his lips at the last day, well done, good and faithful servant. Not because we deserve to hear those words, but because those words are because of what he has done for us. Amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding and indeed dominates all understanding in this fallen creation. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until he returns on the last day. Amen.